The Bell X2. Conceived shortly after the Second World War, it would become the first aircraft to travel three times faster than the speed of sound. But despite this, it is mostly remembered for being a horribly delayed, mismanaged, and grossly unsafe program that paid too high a price for its achievements. It was developed as the eventual successor to the Bell X-1, a highly experimental rocket-powered aircraft that was the first to officially exceed Mark I in level flight. On paper, the X-2 was an improvement in almost every way – aerofoil design, power plant, endurance, and of course, speed. But in practice, it was disastrous. The program was hampered by delays, development problems, and tragically, fatal accidents. Only two X-2s would be built, and both of them would be lost in two very different, but very horrific ways. Though it pushed the envelope further than any aircraft thus far, becoming the first to exceed Mark III, its troubled development and fatal service record made it famous for all the wrong reasons. The Bell X-1 was often seen as the herald of the supersonic era, whereas the X-2 was viewed as a high-speed Widowmaker. But before we talk about the tragic X2, I'd like to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace, whose service I use to build my website. In the past few videos sponsored by Squarespace, I've been walking you through the design of my website, and today we're going to be building my archive page. The archive is where I will show off the old photos and records in my collection, and it's also a place where you can submit your own photos and records if you so desire. Thankfully, Squarespace has a huge collection of templates to make the design process easier, and I found that the so-called project templates suited my needs best. Once I found one I liked, I needed to add a section where viewers can contact me to submit their items. All of the pre-built templates can be easily modified, so it was simply a case of adding a new section and selecting from one of the pre-made contact templates. You can build your own contact form from the ground up if you want, but seeing as the pre-built ones can be completely edited whilst retaining their functionality, I saw little point, plus it saved me a heap of time. Once the functionality of the page was set up, I was able to create my first archive post. This consisted of some of the many photos that my grandfather took during his time in Africa during the Second World War. Thankfully, these could all be uploaded at once, and I was able to add captions for the photos that had things scribbled on the back. One of them also made for a really nice background photo, which was easy to crop, move about, and adjust using Squarespace's built-in editing tools. And after about 15 minutes or so, the page was done. I did this about mm, six weeks ago, and since then I've already received some submissions, though admittedly I have yet to update them, apologies for that, but I hope this demonstrates just how easy this was to do. No HTML code required, no complicated forms, and no time wasted. So if you want to have a go at building a website for yourself or your business, head over to Squarespace today for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash rexushanger to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, and now, let's get back to the Bell X2. In 1944, at the very beginning of the X1's development, designers at Bell were deliberating on aerofoil design. Initially, it was designed with straight wings, but the idea of replacing them with a pair of swept wings was beginning to gain momentum. Swept wing designs would become a hallmark for many aircraft seen during the Cold War, but at this time it was very much unexplored territory. Swept wing aircraft did exist, some dating back to the early 1900s, but these were all low-speed aircraft, and the only country that had made developments in high-speed designs was Germany. Using wind tunnels that simulated speeds up to Mark 4.4, they had begun work on the problem that seemed to prevent the possibility of practical supersonic aircraft – high-speed transonic drag. I touched on this briefly in the X1 video, but I'll go over it again for my newer viewers who may not have seen it. Basically, before an aircraft reaches the speed of sound, some of the air flowing over it will already do so. This results in shockwaves forming on the wing, and these shockwaves interfere with the airflow, essentially acting as an invisible shield, which causes increased drag. The lowest speed in which this occurs is called the aircraft's critical Mach number, and depending on the design of the aircraft, this can happen at speeds considerably slower than the speed of sound. 
This phenomenon often presented an additional problem with control. As these shockwaves usually formed ahead of the control surfaces on a wing, said surfaces will become ineffective. Before these concepts were fully understood, it was often called compressibility, as many pilots said it felt like their controls were being pressed down or held in place. Following a multitude of tests, German engineers had settled on a swept wing design as the best means to get around this problem. This delayed the onset of transonic shockwaves, thus increasing the critical Mach number, but by war's end they were still far away from perfecting it, and although Operation Paperclip would bring valuable German data into US hands, the swept wing of the Bell X2 was developed independently. America's own swept wing research was led by Robert Jones at NACA, or NACA depending on your preference. He had discovered the benefits of swept wings during his research into ultra-thin aerofoils, something directly relevant to the X1 program, and he in turn talked to Theodore von Kármán, who was a member of the Army Air Force's scientific advisory group. His research showed that a biconvex aerofoil could be the key to developing an effective high-speed swept wing, and in the latter half of 1944, he worked with Carmen to gather more data. In April of 1945, Jones officially presented his findings to NACA and the Army Air Force. The Air Force was interested in the potential of swept wing technology, but they decided to agree with NACA's decision to push forward with a straight wing design for the X-1. This was partly because it sought more data on straight wings to support development of the Lockheed P-80, and partly because swept wings had not been full-scale tested in the United States thus far. All that being said, enough interest had been shown for Bell to draw up a proposal for a high-speed swept wing design known as the Model 37D. This was essentially a Bell X-1 with a 40 degree sweep back on its wings, but early wind tunnel tests showed that it did not play nicely with the X-1's fuselage, and so Bell then proposed an all new ground up design known as the Model 52. The preliminary contract was signed with the Air Force on December 14th 1945, just nine months after the contracts for the X-1 had been put to paper. This contract called for the design and construction of two supersonic aircraft that would be designated as the XS-2. Known in-house as Project MX-743, it was led by Bell's chief engineer, Robert Stanley. He assembled a team that included engineers Stanley Smith and Paul Emmons, as well as test pilot Jack Woolhams. Together, they were tasked with designing, building, and testing two aircraft meant to fly higher and faster than any others built thus far, with an absolute end goal of achieving speeds in excess of Mark III and altitudes beyond 100,000 feet, which for 1945 was an almost incomprehensible challenge. The team, most of whom were also working on the Bell X-1, quickly realised that this would be a long development process. But as it turned out, the development of the X-2 would run on for far, far longer than anyone could have reasonably expected. To break it down simply, they were faced with five main challenges. Aerofoil design, control, survivability, heat management, and propulsion. There were other challenges, of course, but these were the five big ones. As far as things went, the question of aerofoil design would actually prove to be one of the simpler challenges faced by Bell engineers. As the swept wing was to be the main aerodynamic feature of the XS2, the concept was extensively tested. Wind tunnel tests focused on the high-speed data, but information on low-speed handling would be gathered using a heavily modified P-39C. Two of these strange aircraft were built. The first was to gather data for the Douglas Skyrocket, and the second was for the Bell XS-2. Known as the L-39, the first flew in April of 1946, and the second, designed for the XS-2, first flew at some point between June and August. The aircraft featured a sweep bank of 35 degrees, and the planned biconvex aerofoil of the XS-2 was imitated on the second L-39 as closely as possible. Flown by Bell test pilot Tex Johnston, it was used to correlate data with the wind tunnel experiments at both low and high speeds. The data it provided was valuable, but it quickly outlived its usefulness, and all testing was concluded by the end of August. Following this, the L-39 went to Langley, and after a spell there, it went to NACA's Ohio Research Center, eventually being scrapped in 1955. 
After evaluating data from the wind tunnels, the L-39, and experimenting with several wing configurations, the design team settled for a low-mounted wing with 40 degrees of sweep back and 3 degrees of dihedral. It would have a span of 32 feet and feature the innovative biconvex aerofoil tested by the L-39. The all-moving, powered horizontal stabiliser would share a similar design. It had the same sweep angle as the main wings, but a thinner aerofoil section was chosen to give it a higher critical Mach number. The same principle had been applied successfully to the X1 airframe, thus ensuring that the airflow over the two surfaces would differ so that they would not lose lift at the same transonic speeds, which of course could lead to serious instability. And this brings us on to the next challenge, control. Wind tunnel tests showed that the ailerons lost effectiveness in the transonic speed range and suffered from control reversal, meaning they gave the opposite effect to the intended pilot's input. Not exactly ideal. To reduce the risk of this, the ailerons had blunt trailing edges that were half the thickness of the leading edge. Unlike the X1, whose hydraulic controls proved difficult to handle when it encountered high speed instability, the X2's design team wanted a fully electric control system, known more commonly nowadays as fly-by-wire. This was meant to be achieved with screw jack actuators to give the pilot sufficient control authority throughout the entire speed range. Lighter than a hydraulic control system, the experimental fly-by-wire controls, developed by Bendix by the way, had artificial feel built in, so that the pilot would not apply too much force accidentally, which would not be an ideal situation at supersonic speeds when said moves could be fatal. As the X2 was to be rocket-powered, power for this system was meant to be provided by a 300-pound 28-volt battery that would provide approximately 30 minutes of power. Now I say meant to provide, with emphasis. The system was installed in the first X2 during its construction, but ground tests showed that the electrical signals sent to the control surfaces failed to keep up with the pilot's control inputs. This caused a backlog of signals, which the system struggled to match, which eventually led to it operating the ailerons at such a high frequency that one could be forgiven for thinking that the pilot was possessed. Naturally, the prospect of violently incorrect flight controls at supersonic speeds was unappealing, and the fly-by-wire system was swapped out for a hydraulic system. Fly-by-wire would make a return with the later experimental aircraft, but for the moment the concept was too far ahead of the existing technology available to be deemed safe. Speaking of safety, in the event that something catastrophic did go wrong, a suitable means of escape had to be made available to the pilot. The extreme speed, low temperatures, and airless conditions of the X-2's planned flights ruled out conventional means of escape, and so the cockpit had to be built to also act as an emergency escape pod. The main challenge was to find ways of separating the nose cleanly, and instantly, and then stabilising it as it descended from an altitude of over 100,000 feet. The first iteration of the design was tested under Project Blossom 3. Fitted to a repurposed V-2 rocket, the nose and escape system of an X-2 was launched to 150,000 feet at 3,000 miles an hour. It then separated, was partially slowed and stabilised by a drogue chute, and once it reached 29,000 feet, a 64-foot parachute opened to bring it down to the ground. The test was inconclusive at best. Not only was this aggressive vertical flight not an accurate simulation of the X-2's use, as it flew far too high and in the wrong direction, but some of the parachute lines were cut by the gyrating nose of the pod during the more rapid stages of its descent. Further experiments finally led to an acceptable escape system, but even this was far from perfect. The nose would separate from the rest of the airframe by four explosive pistons, subjecting the pilot to a 20G forward jolt. After separation, a ribbon-style drogue chute would deploy, stabilising the nose cone and bringing it into a relatively slow descent of a few hundred miles an hour, and as it descended and the atmosphere grew denser, the speed would drop, eventually reaching a sedate 120 miles an hour, and once the nose reached 10,000 feet, a buzzer in the cockpit would sound, directing the pilot to manually bail out using a standard parachute. While technically practical, this proposal did assume that the pilot had remained conscious after the 20G separation of the nose. 
The escape process would be further complicated by the need for the pilot to wear a restrictive and bulky pressure suit and helmet. After wind tunnel tests, a scale model of this new system was dropped from a C-47 for practical evaluations. Though it worked as intended, the US Air Force and NACA differed in their opinions of its safety. The Air Force viewed it as acceptable, NACA did not. And these opinions would come under close scrutiny for reasons that will soon become apparent. All the faffing about with the control services and the escape system would have caused extensive delays, but the X2 program was already being delayed by two other major challenges, heat management and propulsion. Heat management was a new challenge, and a big one at that. Up until this point, no aircraft had flown at a speed where airspeed friction was a cause for concern, but the X-2 changed this. It was known that aluminium would soften and distort at temperatures above 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and the skin temperatures of the X-2 were expected to exceed 630 degrees Fahrenheit at Mach 3. Additionally, being powered by a liquid rocket, its internal fuel would be at temperatures below negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit, which meant Bell had to find an alloy that could maintain its strength with a temperature variance of some 800 degrees. Eventually, after almost two years of experimentation, they finally hit upon a solution. All of the flying surfaces would be skinned with stainless steel, tapered from root to tip, and much of the fuselage structure would be made from a nickel-copper alloy known as K-monol. It had twice the strength of steel, and was heat resistant up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. It was also very resistant to corrosion that would be caused by the fuel and oxidizer used in the rocket motors, and it could be easily spot welded or brazed for airframe construction. The trade-off was an increase in weight, and a much higher cost, but it had to be done. The use of such specialised metals marked a real break from traditional construction methods, and one that would be repeated with other high-speed experiments moving forward. However, for Bell, the development of their heat-resistant materials cost them even more time, and it was not until 1951 that the first heat-resistant sections of the X-2 started to come together. All that being said, the material delay was nothing when compared to what became the biggest challenge of them all, at least from a time frame perspective, and that was the power plant. The existing rocket motor from the Bell X-1, the reaction motor's XLR-11, was unsuitable. Not only was its modest 6,000 pounds of thrust inadequate to propel the X-2 beyond Mark III, but its method of thrust control was primitive. It used four chambers, and thrust was controlled simply by firing up or shutting off a set number of them, one, two, or four. This was not only rudimentary, but unsafe, as unspent fuel that pulled in the chambers could risk a mid-flight explosion. For the X-2, a new type of motor that could be controlled by a throttle was required. Bell had originally planned to develop this new rocket themselves, but the contract was assigned to Curtis Wright instead, as it was felt that Bell already had enough on their hands with the rest of the X-2 program as it was. Curtis Wright had a little experience in this field, which honestly should have been a giant red flag, but they eventually got the job done. Basing some of their work off research done by Robert Goddard, a pioneer in liquid rocket development, they developed the XLR-25, a two-chamber rocket that delivered a maximum thrust of 15,000 pounds. It featured several innovations over the one that powered the X-1. To save weight, the three fuel tanks were made integral to the fuselage, an additional 20% reduction in weight was made with the use of turbopump pressurization, it was comparatively smaller, meaning more space could be allocated for fuel, and of course it featured a throttle, which was variable between 50% and 100% power. But despite all these impressive innovations, there was one giant problem. It took them over eight years to develop it. The delay was so serious that the X-2 was in danger of becoming totally obsolete before it had even flown. Most of the research data on swept wings that the X-2 could have yielded by 1952 was already being collected from the Douglas 558. Preliminary discussions were already being made on the development of the X-15, which would explore hypersonic speeds, and modified versions of the X-1 were being prepped for speeds in excess of Mark II as it was. In 1952, the Air Force seriously considered terminating the program, but at the 11th hour, the first XLR-25 rocket motors finally appeared, and the X-2 was saved from oblivion, 
at least for a time. With the aircraft mostly complete, albeit years behind schedule now, it was finally time to put them to work. The first flights of the X-2, like the X-1, would be captive flights. As the rocket motor burned through its fuel in about three minutes, the X-2 had to be airlifted to 31,000 feet by a Boeing EB-50. These initial captive flights were to confirm the stability of both aircraft, and to familiarise the test pilot and the assisting crew with the procedures. The second X-2 was completed first, and it completed its first captive flights in July of 1951. After several of these flights proved that everything was seemingly stable, the first unpowered flight was completed on the 27th of June 1952. Unpowered both for safety and because the rocket motor was yet to actually arrive. Unfortunately, this maiden flight would begin a long string of bad luck. The X-2 was seriously damaged on landing when the nose wheel collapsed, the result of violent pitching after it had initially touched down with its rear landing skids. After sliding along the dry lake bed of Muroc for over 1,000 feet, the battered X-2 came to rest and was hastily rushed off for repairs. The test program was delayed for another two months while new parts were assembled and repairs were completed. During this time, a modified landing skid was installed that was hoped to avoid the embarrassing scenes of the first flight, and a far more successful glide flight then took place on the 10th of October. When the XLR-25 rockets finally appeared at the start of 1953, both X-2s were now complete and ready to receive them. As it had been flown the most thus far, the second was selected for the first installation and the first powered flights. After a series of ground tests, it began a short program of fueled captive flights to test all the tanking equipment and so on. And this is where things went horribly wrong. During a pressurization test, flying over Lake Ontario, the X-2 violently exploded. The explosion was so strong that it blasted the EB-50 100 feet vertically in a matter of seconds, and nearly took out the escorting chase aircraft with a piece of shrapnel. Bell's chief test pilot, Gene Ziegler, who was monitoring the fuel levels from the bomb bay, was killed in the explosion, along with Frank Wolko, a technician who was seen falling unconscious from the aircraft a moment later. Remarkably, the EB-50's pilots managed to ease the crippled bomber back to the ground, but it was a complete write-off and never flown again. Initially, the finger of blame pointed at the rocket motor. NACA had frequently complained about the quality of the XLR-25 during static tests, but although they were not wholly reliable, they were not the responsible party. It would take a further two years of delays, testing, finger-pointing, and the loss of other Bell aircraft before the mystery was solved. In 1955, following the explosions of the Bell X-1D and then the X-1A, the leather fuel gaskets were discovered to be the cause. The chemicals they were treated with were found to leak into the fuel tanks, where they would react violently with the liquid oxygen if subjected to a sudden jolt, such as turbulence or airframe vibration. Bell engineer Wendell Moore proved this when he dipped a sample of the same leather into liquid oxygen, struck it with a hammer, and almost blew his arm off. Following this, the gaskets were replaced with ones made from new materials, and the problem disappeared overnight. Now, years behind schedule, and with the Superior X-15 now in full development, the remaining X-2 had a limited window of time to prove its usefulness. But its bad luck continued. After a series of glide flights, two of which resulted in further collapsed landing gears or broken skids, further delays were then caused by problems with the flaps, emergency fuel dumping procedures, and the continued unreliability of the rocket motor in ground tests. As the project entered its 10th year without any useful results, the team was given a final deadline of December the 31st, 1955, after which the Air Force would abandon the project altogether. Just six weeks before this deadline, the X-2 finally completed its first powered flight. With test pilots Frank Everest at the controls, the first flight reached a maximum speed of Mark 0.95. Following a four-month pause, where minor changes were made to the airframe, and the engineers continued to scream and plead with the rocket motor to behave itself, a second flight took place in March. The first supersonic flight took place in April, reaching Mark 1.2, and in July, though he was no longer the main test pilot for the program, Everest reached Mark 2.86, which was the unofficial world speed record at the time. 
In Everest's place, Ivan Kinchelow set even more records, which included a world altitude record of 126,000 feet on the 7th of September 1956, a record that would not be broken until the arrival of the X-15. But it was the X-2's final flight that would put it in the history books for both the best and the worst reasons. In the final flights of the program, Kinchelow and Milburn Apt, the X-2's other new test pilot, were set on a series of flights to continually push the performance envelope of the X-2 as far as possible, with the goal of reaching speeds in excess of Mark III. For a time, this had been thought impossible, but by the middle of 1956, the rocket motor was now producing more thrust than ever, and the airframe had provided enough data to determine the optimum flight path and altitude to achieve such speeds. On the 27th of September, APT finally reached the program's end goal, and achieved a speed of Mark 3.196 at 67,000 feet. But less than 10 minutes after this event, he was dead. From a superstitious point of view, the disastrous end of this flight can be seen in the numbers. It may have been the 13th powered flight of the X-2, a deeply unlucky number as it was, but it was only APT's first attempt under rocket power. Though he had put in many, many hours in the Gida simulator, which to its credit was incredibly accurate, his inexperience was his downfall. Owing to the high speeds of the flight, Apt realised he would overshoot his landing site. He attempted a long bank in the X-2 to bring it around on a different return flight, but during this bank the aircraft encountered a condition known as inertial coupling, which was basically a wild tumbling motion, and Apt was forced to use the escape system. The system deployed flawlessly, but the extreme g-forces had likely knocked Apt unconscious, as he never got out of the cockpit. The stabilising parachute was never meant to slow the capsule for a safe landing, and it landed nose first at 120 miles an hour, crumpling the capsule and killing Apt instantly. The crash brought the X-2 program to a violent end, and one that was quickly shrouded in secrecy, both to hide the development of Mac 3 flight, and to hide a loss that many felt was unnecessary. Apt's death raised several critical questions. Why was he allowed to travel so fast on his first flight? Why had the aircraft become so uncontrollable? Why had the program raced from Mark 1 to Mark 3 in just over four months? From the start, NACA had voiced concerns about both the escape system and the aircraft's high-altitude longitudinal stability, and by the end of the year, their criticisms of the Air Force's handling had become scathing. They accused the Air Force of chasing performance records in favour of safety and useful research data, and in consequence of this, they were reluctant to involve them in flying the X-15, it being so much faster and potentially more dangerous. As the arguments raged behind the scenes, news of the achievements of the X-1 and the X-2 were eventually leaked to the public, but the tragic mismanagement of the latter would always overshadow its accomplishments. The X-2 would become a textbook example of delay and misuse, a program that went too far in its attempts to redeem itself, and its loss brought an end to a decade that saw some of the boldest and riskiest test programs ever attempted. Rising development costs and much stricter safety standards would ensure that such risks would rarely be ventured upon again, and never in the frequency that was seen with the X-2. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I apologise if my voice is a bit up and down, I had to record this video in three takes because I kept losing my voice. Um, thank you of course to the patrons, the wonderful people whose names are now appearing on the screen, and a big thank you of course to the Wing Commander tier patrons. I don't think I've missed anyone's name this week, um, I checked the sheet this morning, the little spreadsheet the patron sends me, and everything should be up to date. If I have missed anyone, I apologise, and you'll be updated in the next video's end screen. But thank you all so much for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.